So tonight we're delighted to be hearing from an expert in the realm of uh, the economy, free enterprise, and ethics. Dr. Yuren Brook is originally from Israel, and he's an internationally sought lecturer, author, and businessman, and currently serves as the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, and he was the CEO there for 17 years. He's written several books, such as In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. Uh, Dr. Brooks earned his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas, and also uh, served as a finance professor at Santa Clara University. Dr. Brooks is also the host of The Aaron Brook Show, which you can find on YouTube and Twitter. Let's give Dr. Brooks a warm welcome as he comes and speaks. I just got off my so I'm a little dehydrated. So I as I was saying, I uh, just got off an airplane from Warm, Puerto Rico. I don't like this white stuff you have on the ground. I don't, I don't, <laughs> like it. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know why you want to live with it, but so be it. Um, all right, I'm curious, before I get started, um, how many of you have read anything by Ayn Rand? All right, cool. A lot of newbies, that's good. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, I think, The Wonders of Capitalism. Is that a title? The title is Wonders of Capitalism. And indeed, uh, one of the things that I think uh, a lot of people, I'm going to get rid of this. One of the things that I think a lot of people um, kind of ignore is the amazing life we have. We live in an amazing world. Certainly from a material perspective, there's never been a better time to be alive. Uh, and y you can see that in pretty much everything. Just the fact that I I'm here in Michigan, I started the day in Puerto Rico, I could make that trip. Just think about what that trip was like 100 years ago. Think about what that trip even 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, getting on a plane was a little dicey. Last time there was a fatality in a US airplane was 13 years ago. Like millions of flights every single day, m billions of uh, you know, miles flown every single year and nobody dies. It's, it's, it's amazing. We live in this amazing place. I think best illustrated by my favorite lecture prop, which is the iPhone. I mean, this thing is just stunning and amazing and changes, uh, you know, changed life, changes the life, and illustrative of just how far we come as a species, right? I mean, this is, we call this a phone, but that's a joke, right? It's nothing phonish about this. I mean, you guys don't remember what phones looked like. They had these, you know, you picked it up and you had these things you dialed and there was, there was a cable that connected it to, to the wall. And you paid an arm and a leg, I mean, a huge amount of money to, to make phone calls. I, I remember when I first emigrated to the United States from Israel, uh, I never called my parents. Like, I called them once every th three months. And the reason for that was that I couldn't afford the calls. They couldn't afford the calls. We just didn't talk. Today I can call my kids, you know, from anywhere in the world pretty much. I do a video chat with them, read them a bedtime story, um, all at a marginal cost of zero. It doesn't cost me anything, right? And listen to every piece of music ever written by mankind. They, they, well, maybe not every one that's written, but every, certainly every one that's been recorded and, mm -hmm. and produced is on here. I can watch movies on this. I, I you know, I, I found this. I, I again, you, you guys are too young, but I remember having to navigate with maps, mm -hmm. literally paper things while driving in the night with snow on the ground. I could, I wouldn't have made it. Right? No way, I would have made it. I made it just in time anyway. <laughs> uh, and and you could go on and on. And all this is in this little bundle that is pretty beautiful to top it all off. It's got real aesthetic qualities. I mean, I, I get these uh, I get these tweets. I don't know if you get these tweets from somebody called Cultural Critic, I think he's called, or something like that. And he always puts up these pictures of fabulous 12th century cathedrals. And he says, we don't build anything like this anymore. What an awful culture we live in. I'll take this any day over any 12th century cathedral. It's just as beautiful. And it's a lot more functional. <laughs> you can probably you know, <laughs> talk to it. <laughs> anyway, right? So we live in amazing times. We're super rich. Even the poor among us are relatively rich, particularly in the United States. People that are poor have air conditioning and heating. Not that long ago, those didn't exist. They have automobiles, they have televisions, they have iPhones, or the equivalent of. 
maybe a cheaper version of. We're unbelievably rich. And, and indeed, we're so rich that we don't even know it because we can't even comprehend what life was like before this, what life was like without this. For all of human history, we have all been dirt poor. I mean, really, really, really poor. Uh, the UN today categorizes extreme poverty as $2 a day or less. What percentage of the world population do you think 300 years ago lived on $2 a day or less? 50, 60, 20, 100, 100, 100's close. Like 95, 96%. Few aristocrats up here maybe made five bucks a day. It's not like they had running water or electricity or iPhones, or automobiles, or private jets, or any of that. But 95% of the human population on planet Earth lived on $2 a day or less. How many today? Anybody know? Four. Yeah. 30? 30. That's a typical, typical number that people throw out there. You just yell it out. You're not in class. Yeah. Oh, like one eight. Yeah. What's that? About one eight. One eight. Oh, so it's 12, 12 and a half percent. Something like that, right? Right, okay, anybody else? Better than 30. Give me that. 5%? 5 is the closest, 8%. 8% of the world population. Of course, almost all of us are overly pessimistic about these numbers. We all think there are lots of really, really poor people out there in the world, and over the last 30 years, about a billion people have come out of extreme poverty. Primarily in Asia, but even in Africa, and certainly in the rest of the world. So, 300 years ago, we were all dirt poor. Everybody. And now, only 8% of the population is dirt poor. And even that it doesn't really capture it because the rest of us are not just a little bit above extreme poverty. We're like super rich. So, we had this period, basically of 100,000 years from the beginning of Homo sapiens, right? where we basically stayed about at $2 a day or less. We, we were subsistence hunter-gatherers for a long time, and then we were subsistence farmers, and all we did was farm. We, we kind of got up in the morning and went and did our stuff and came home, and it was dark, and we ate. Maybe we built a fire, ate something, and went to sleep. Nobody could read. And there was no time to read, and there was no lighting with which to read. And there was nothing to read. Right? All the books were literally written out by hand, because there was no printing press. And for all that period of time, would do it poor. I mean, things get a little bit better, like during Greece and Rome, and then they collapse, and then they stay pretty depressed, and they get a little better with the Renaissance, and a little better after the Renaissance, through the night, and then suddenly, they go like that. And you know, and, and you have to jump a few stories up to get to where we are today relative to the by just by income we're about three hundred times richer than they were three hundred years ago. But in reality you can't capture the number because we're so much because how do you measure how do you measure the value of running water? You, you can't do it in dollars. Well, well how much would you pay? to keep your running water versus not have it anymore. No flushing toilets, no showers, no bath, no, none of that, right? Or electricity, just the value of it. I mean, we pay electric bills and that's how us economists measure the value of it, but it's really that much, much more valuable to us than just the amount of money we pay for it. It makes all that possible. So we today are thousands of times better off than we were 300 years ago as human beings. And, s and so we went from this period of flat, nothing, nothing's happened. Y you're born, you die with the same stuff. You know the American dream that your kids are richer uh, and, and more well off than, than the parents are and every generation is better off. That's like completely modern. There's no such thing for 100,000 years. You're basically just as poor as you were born and your kids are going to be just as poor as when they were born and it, nothing changes. People don't travel. 
people don't go anywhere. It's very difficult to travel. Where do you go? It's only a certain radius that you can travel by foot or on a horse or on a buggy. Life, I think the technical term for it sucks. <laughs> I think Hobbes said, what is it? Uh, short, brutish something. And nasty, shortish, and brute. Uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And it was. Life expectancy, up until about two, three hundred years ago. Anybody know? 30-ish. Yeah, 30-ish. You know, uh, probably in, in, in the 18th century, it's around 39 at best, right? So, I, you know, I'm long dead. You guys are kind of middle age. <laughs> don't have much to go. Don't have much to live. You, you guys, right now, how old you are, you have less life expectancy left than I have today at my age. That's how bizarre it is. But it's hard for us to even contemplate that. But that's life. Most kids die before they reach the age of ten. A lot of women die childbirth. A lot of children die childbirth. And what about the 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 day to day life, the, the the kind of the decisions that you make? Do you, do you decide who to marry? Mostly not. Most the others decide for you. Relatively modern phenomena of deciding for yourself who you're going to marry. Your parents make a match. We still have some cultures in the world today that do that, but it, it used to be that pretty much everybody did that. Do you decide what profession to go into? What, what profession did you go into? What profession did you do? Your parents. Oh, yeah. Whatever, it, parents, God, parents. As if women mattered. <laughs> your, your father's profession. <coughs> your, women didn't work. <coughs> Zero, I mean none. I mean, once in a while, there's a rare exception where somehow she squeezed this through, but women don't work. Men work. And sons go into the profession of their father. They join the guild. Whatever guild their father's in, they go, they're in. That's, that's what they do. You know, I was wondering about this because uh, then you get somebody like my, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, I don't know if you know much about him, but he was like, he was the meaning of renaissance man he did a bunch of different things he was an engineer he was a, a war tactician he advised kings he he was of course an artist he sculpted he painted he did all these things it was like how did he get away with that his father was a um uh you know uh, what do you call the a notary he was a notary so why didn't leonardo da vinci why wasn't he forced to join the notary guild and become a notary so what what allowed leonardo to have this freedom of being able to choose to do all these amazing, interesting, fascinating things. His father had a lot of money. No, his father didn't. He was an notary. Just a simple notary. Yeah. Uh, he was illegitimate. So he was illegitimate. He was a bastard. <laughs> Technical term. <laughs> yeah. He was illegitimate. So the guild wouldn't accept him. So it was actually an advantage to be illegitimate because then you had the freedom, if you were a genius like Leonardo at least, to be able to go out and, and make choices in the world that most people just did not have. Life was regimented, it was controlled, it was determined. And then something happens. And we, you know, just accelerate in terms of growth, in terms of success, in terms of prosperity. And there's a there's a kind of a pivot year, right? You go flat, 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 and then it goes up. Anybody Anybody have an idea what the year would be? What's the year where all of that changes? Where things start accelerating upwards? 1453. 1453, a little early. We still got a period of flatness from 1453 on. Although things in certain parts of Europe are getting a little bit better, but nothing like the, just the, the cliff that you climb uh, once you get to... 1600s. No, still pretty early. Until 1776. <laughs> <laughs> 1776, I love it. A absolutely. That's exactly the year when it happens. I'm, I'm being ridiculous, of course. There's no, uh, there's no one year where it happens. But 1776 is a great market. It's a great year. Because, in a sense, that's the period in which it happens. 
1776, three important things happen that I think set the course of history and determine that this path will be pursued. So, of course, you guys know one thing, right? I, I, I usually give this talk in the UK in 1776. <laughs> um, but one of the things that happens in 1776, uh, two of the things actually happen in England. Anybody know a famous book is published in 1776? Anybody know what that book was? Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith is published in England in 1776. This is a book that establishes the first real uh, work in economics that is establishing that markets work. <coughs> that free trade, free trade, well, I'll have to talk to you conservatives about free trade, <laughs> free trade actually works and is massively beneficial to mankind, right? And uh, he lays it all out and he explains how markets works and, and the dynamics of markets. So Adam Smith has written. Second thing that happens in England in 1776 is it's the, it's the year where you see the first commercialization the application of the steam engine to industry. Before, they were tinkering with steam engines and they were using them to pump water out of mines, but they hadn't really used it for industry. 1776 is the first year in which it's applied. And the third thing, of course, that happens in 1776 is the greatest political document in all of human history is <coughs> written and signed, and that is the Declaration of Independence of the United States. And what makes that document important, and what makes that document revolutionary, is that it consolidates the ideas that had been building up in intellectual circles over about a hundred years before that. And it consolidates that into a succinct statement that basically revolutionizes the world and creates that. And what is that statement? Basically, that all men are created equal. So it does away with aristocracy. It does away with monarchy. It does away with kings. It does away with anybody who is special before the law and establishes equality before the law. Not equality of outcome, as the left would like. Not equality of opportunity, as many conservatives pretend to like. <laughs> But equality before the law, equality of liberty, equality of freedom, equality of rights. And that's the real revolution. The real revolution is this idea that we have rights. And it's not we have rights. You as individuals, each one of us as an individual has rights. But rights are the individuals. And they're inalienable. What does inalienable mean? Can't be taken away by anybody. Well, what if 99% of the people vote against it? Can't take, it can't take it away. Now, you can. They do it every day here in America. Uh, they do it everywhere, every day all over the world. But they shouldn't. And they're violating your rights by doing it. Even when 99% of the people vote to silence you because they don't like what you're saying. That's wrong. That's a violation of rights. And the document says that's wrong. So you have an inalienable rights to what? What do you have a right to? I have liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, so what does life mean? What does it mean to have a right to life? What does that mean? What does it mean to have a right to life? Nobody can kill me, is that about it? Right, no murder, that's, that's it. What, what does right to life mean? Uh, freedom to act and uh, the right to your property. Yeah, it's the freedom to act. It's the freedom to use your mind in pursuit of your values. To act in, in pursuit of those values. To achieve your goals. Free of... What's the one thing that violates rights? Violence. Violence. Force. So you have a right to your life to do with it as you see fit based on your reasoning mind. Free of coercion, free of force, free of authority. It's your life. You get to make decisions about it. Nobody else can decide for you. As Jefferson says, I'm paraphrasing, 
If your neighbor doesn't have his hand in your pocket, what he does in his life is none of your business. He's not violating your rights. What he does with his right, with his life, is his business. So rights are the freedom to live based on your mind in pursuit of your values. You have a right to life, which is the fundamental right. All rights derive right from that right to life. You have a right to liberty. What does that mean? You have a right to say, to write, to speak, to think, to advocate for anything you want. It's the fundamental intellectual right. It's the idea that, again, you are free to think based on your own judgment and to act based on your own judgment. And nobody has a right to impose their will on you. And finally, in a, you know, uh, unfortunately, they, they crossed out the right to property. It was there in the original draft uh, that Jefferson had written. They crossed it out. Uh, but it's implied in the right to life. You act to gain property, and you have a, that becomes part of you, and you have a right to it. Nobody, in, in other words, nobody can take it from you. Right? Interesting how today we interpret that, and we violate property rights all the time without any compunction. And finally, in the most, I'd say, revolutionary statement of all of them, is do you have a right to pursue not the common good, not the public interest, not the national whatever, but you have a right to pursue what? Your happiness. Your happiness. And that's a stone. And following that, pretty much, and its exploitation, these ideas are then, I mean, they come to the United States from Europe, and then in a sense they're exported back to Europe. You get an explosion of freedom and liberty. And when I say the wonders of capitalism, what does capitalism mean? What is capitalism? Free exchange. A free exchange. It's one part of capitalism, right? Is is we get to we get to decide how to how to trade with one another. What else? What else does capitalism mean? Yeah. It means that there's a government and it's only responsible. The only thing it's supposed to do is defend the rights of its citizens. Yeah. So so capitalism really means freedom. And what freedom acquires is a government that does only one thing, and that's protect your <coughs> rights. Protect this right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Protect you from coercion and force, which means the government can't use coercion and force. It can only use force in retaliation to protect you. Can't use force to impose its will on you, because then it's violating your rights, and it's doing the opposite of what it's being set up to do. So capitalism is the system of rights. It is the system where rights are protected, where the role of government, the only role of government, is the protection of rights. In a sense, capitalism is the system the founding fathers created in this country. It is the political system they establish. It's not just an economic system. It, the, the economics of it, the free exchange, is what comes out of leaving people free. Because people always exchange. The question is, do you exchange under conditions of coercion and uncertainty about whether the contract will hold? or whether somebody will run off, whether the police are going to be bribed, you know, as much of the world trades and exchanges, or whether you exchange in an environment in which you know that your rights will be protected and therefore the exchange is enforceable at the very least. So this idea of rights brings about this explosion of growth. This idea of capitalism brings about this explosion of growth. And that's what we have benefited from for the last 200 and some years. During that period, of course, we never fully reached a point where the government just did that. We never fully reached a point where the government actually only protected rights. I mean, right in the beginning, for example, what did we have? Which was a massive rights violation. Slavery. Slavery, right? So from the beginning, we lived in this contradiction of some freedom, some, you know, uh, uh, integrity with the Constitution and with the, with the Declaration, but then 
violations of it. And, you know, even once you have a civil war and you get rid of slavery, uh, the government very quickly starts regulating and taxing and controlling and trying to manipulate markets and deviating from its responsibility to protect rights and engaging in rights, in rights violation in order to achieve other goals that are outside kind of the, the founding documents uh, as, as, they were, as they were written. So capitalism has never really been achieved. We've never really lived in a fully capitalist world. But this is the thing. The closer you get to that world, the better off we are, empirically. The further away you get from that world, the worse off we are. The more economic freedom you allow, the more protection of individual rights you have in a society, the richer, more prosperous, more <coughs> successful it becomes. It's no accident America is as rich and successful as we are. It's not because of natural resources. It's not because we're smarter than the rest of the people in the world. It's not because our country is particularly beautiful, even if those all are true. The reason America is rich is because we've been, relatively speaking, the freest of all the nations out there. And therefore, we're engaged in that activity that produces that kind of wealth, which is the voluntary production and voluntary exchange. You know, maybe, maybe the most dramatic example, I mean, there are a lot of dramatic examples of kind of this tilt and, and change between what happens when you're free and what happens when you're not from a, a purely economic perspective or from a rights perspective, um, which the two are related. Uh, we now, uh, I don't know if you guys are following, I'm following pretty closely the, uh, the uh, uh, presidency of Millet in uh, Argentina, right? We've got this, uh, this real uh, uh, pro-free market guy who's become a president of a country. I, it's just bizarre the stuff he says. No president says that stuff. I, you know, he's, the, he's by far, in terms of at least what he says, we'll see what he does, still to be determined. But what he says may be the most interesting political figure, I don't know, in 100 years probably. Um, and, and certainly the best in terms of his, econo his spoken economic policies. Again, we'll see what he does. But Argentina's history is fascinating. Argentina got a constitution in the 1860s, which was basically very much modeled around the American constitution, very oriented towards liberty and freedom and protection of individual rights. As a consequence of that, it embraced capitalism and became one of the five richest countries in the world in the early part of the 20th century. It was almost as rich as the United States by 1914. It was almost as rich as the United States on a per capita GDP. Argentina is a big country geographically, but doesn't have a lot of people. Um, a, a big chunk of it is kind of very difficult to inhabit. It's cold, it's deserty, it's, it's, uh, but uh, it's rich in natural resources and it's rich in fertile agricultural land in the north. And it was doing phenomenally well. It was allowed that freedom. It, it massively had mass immigration during the late 19th century, early 20th century. It had, uh, and, uh, and those immigrants, because of the liberty, because of the freedom, because of the protection of rights, produced and built and created. And as a consequence, they got rich. During the 1920s, um, they shifted. And they shifted as the world, later in the 1930s, shifted towards uh, fascism and communism. In Latin America, generally, in Argentina in particular, they shifted towards all kinds of authoritarian regimes. Um, uh, and uh, they went through all kinds of military regimes, Peronism. Anybody see the movie Evita, right? So she was the wife of the, uh, and, and she was a dictator for a while. So they went through all these different regimes and they, they flirted with them all. Socialism in one degree or another. And all of them have basically led to increased poverty. To the point where today, Argentina is about as, you know, on a per capita GDP, 25% uh, of the United States. Less than 25% of the United States. So it's basically, it's grown since 1914, but very little as compared to us. And I don't think we've grown that much uh, because we haven't been that free. So you're seeing that once 
you embrace freedom, you get rich. You embrace unfreedom, you get poor. Uh, Latin America is a great laboratory because they do these radical shifts constantly. So uh, I'll give you two other examples. Uh, anybody know what uh, used to be the richest country in Latin America like 30, 40 years ago? What was the richest country in Latin America? Venezuela. Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America. Venezuela has uh, almost as much oil reserves in the ground as Saudi Arabia. Right? It's the second largest oil reserves in the world of Venezuela. And yet Venezuela, and Venezuela used to be because of the oil, and because it had a you know somewhat free economy. I don't let's not exaggerate how free it was, uh, but relative to Latin America, it was relatively free. It was the richest country in Latin America. Today, Venezuela is the poorest country in Latin America on a per capita GDP. Right? Why? Because over the last 20, 30 years, it's embraced socialism. It's done away with private property. It's nationalized its energy companies, it's nationalized basically agriculture, nationalized the supply chain, and as a consequence has plummeted into poverty. Flip side of that, when Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America, who was the poorest country in Latin America? Poorer than Argentina. Anybody know? Uruguay. Ch Chile. Chile. Yeah. Right? Chile was actually the poorest country in Latin America. Oh, yeah. And in 1980, Chile had um, a kind of economic revolution. <laughs> uh, the dictator at the time, Pinochet, basically said, we're desperate, we're really, really poor, this is really, really bad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, uh, uh, go for it, right? Here, there was a bunch of uh, Chicago trained, Chicago school, Milton Friedman trained economists at the university in Santiago. He went to the university and said, okay, you have the economy, do whatever you want. These are called, the, the, to this day, they're called the Chicago Boys. And they did, they did what they wanted, which is basically cut regulations, privatize their social security, cut taxes, get the government out of a bunch of businesses, and Chilean economy just took off. And today, Chile is the richest country in Latin America on a per capita GDP. What's amazing, right, so these are, these are actual, you can see them, you can go, you can visit, you can read the history, it's, it, these are just simple facts. And what's amazing to me is you would think that everybody then would want to be like Chile. But no. Nobody wants to be like Chile. Every single election in Latin America over the last few years, with the exception of this last one in Argentina, they voted socialists into power, including in Chile. Where they've decided they're too rich, they want to become poor again. So they've embraced socialism. But everywhere and to the extent that you try capitalism to that extent you get rich and you could you could you see it in America the more we regulate the slower economy grows the more we control the slower economy grows the bigger the government is the more the government spends the slower economy grows the less fast we get rich we still are growing but less fast and it doesn't matter and I know this will come as a disappointment. It doesn't matter who's president. Because every single one of them, Democrat or Republican, they all spend like there's no tomorrow. And government spending is the best proxy for government involvement in the economy. They can pretend they're free marketers. They can give great speeches about the free market. They can even have people who pretend to deregulate. But if you follow the dollar, you'll see that every single one of them spends more than he did the year before, more than the president before him did, and they all do. And the bigger the government, the slower the economic growth, the poorer we are relative to what we could be, relative to how rich we could be. And it really doesn't matter. You know, if you actually do the numbers politically in the United States, the best combination, the best kind of political lineup you could have is, for, from, from the perspective of the economy, is a Republican House and Senate and a Democratic President. In the last hundred years, that has produced the best economic results of any combination. If you give Republicans everything, they completely screw it up because they can't help themselves but spend like there's no tomorrow. That was true of Reagan, that was true of Bush, and that was true of Trump. If you give Democrats everything, oh my God, 
right? There's no end, because they're not even embarrassed by it. They just rush in with the spending, right? So the best is if you can get them not to agree on anything. Generally, my view is the best thing that can happen in Washington, the best is gridlock. And government shutdowns, oh God, it, you know, I pray for more of those. <laughs> Every time they do something like bipartisan, they get together and they do something together, I, I, I like them. Yeah. What, what is my escape hatch? What, what, how, how do I get out of here? It's, that's the scariest is when the, when the two political parties actually agree on something. So there's this direct relationship between freedom and rights and between uh, progress and success. Capitalism produces the results. I'll give you one last example because it's going to go away soon, so we might as well exploit it while it's still here. And that is uh, Hong Kong. I don't know if anybody here has been to Hong Kong. Um, and I say it's going to go away. You've been to Hong Kong? Uh, I, I was went Hong Kong for a transfer flight. Okay, through a transfer flight. Yeah, you s did you fly over the city? Uh, you see I, I actually toured the c city for okay. like half a day. So. There you go. So you've been to Hong Kong. That counts. <laughs> right? So Hong Kong, Hong Kong today is, uh, sits on a, it basically sits on, a, on, a, on an island, on a rock. Um, 75 years ago, there was nothing there. It was uh, basically fishing, fishing villages, a series of fishing villages. And the British came to this rock, they, they leased the land from the Chinese and it, for 99 years, and they came to this rock and they basically established the rule of law. And they said, on this rock, you don't get a vote, <coughs> but we'll protect your property, we will uh, protect your freedom of speech, we'll adhere to contracts, we will protect your rights. And there no, you know, anybody can come in. No big immigration laws. Anybody can come into this uh, to this rock. Um, just, you know, play by the rules. Here's the rule of law. Act based on the rule of law. And uh, that's it. And the British set up this governor, and he thought he would have it easy. Nobody would ever come, and they would be quiet, and he'd have uh, he'd be on vacation there. Today, Hong Kong is, what, seven and a half, eight million people? And I'm talking about pre, maybe pre-COVID, right? Uh, seven and a half, eight million people. It's got most skyscrapers in New York City. It's richer than the United States on a per capita GDP basis. It did in 75 years what it took us 250 years to do in terms of wealth creation. It is one of the most exciting, dynamic, energetic places on planet Earth. And how did they get to seven and a half, eight million people? <coughs> people flocked there. They swam there. They did anything they could to go there. Why? Because th they were handing out, uh, you know, free health care, uh, handing out welfare checks, you know, handing out, I don't know, no handouts, nothing, no welfare, no free health care. Why did they go? What did they go for? Uh, because because they'd be free to, uh, to live their own lives and that's what they wanted to do. Because they wanted freedom. They wanted to be free. And they had freedom in Hong Kong uh, until recently. Yeah. <laughs> it's now gone. They had, they had freedom in Hong Kong. And they thrived under freedom. Now, right now, as we speak, there's a trial going on of Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai came to Hong Kong as a, as a young teenager. I think he was 12 or 13. Um, with nothing. Shirt on his back literally showed his back came um, and um, he started working in textiles in, in, in the factories right child labor uh, what do you call those uh, sweatshops right two dollars a day or something awful right we, we would ban those and deny Jimmy Lai a job immediately anyway he built it he, he worked in these sweatshops he was very good at it he ultimately bought a sweatshop one of these uh, one of these factories himself right he ultimately bought a bunch of them became the textile king of Hong Kong, sold his textile business, bought a media business, became one of the biggest media guys in Hong Kong, is a billionaire, and actually ran something called Apple, Apple, uh, Apple uh, Daily. Apple Daily was the newspaper, Apple Media was okay. the big company, and uh, he, he was the main freedom fighter in Hong Kong, fighting for uh, Hong Kong freedom and to prevent the Chinese, anti-Chinese and anti the Chinese taking over Hong Kong, and and he's now being tried for treason and for, you know, for for opposing the the Chinese authorities and probably spend the rest of his life in jail. The guy could have run, he could have escaped at any point in time, 
but he's a fighter, and he was gonna, he, he was, he was, he was going to fight to the end, and he is fighting to the end, sadly. Um, and the end is probably not going to be too good. But uh, there's an example. It's not about the checks, the welfare, the health care. The, it's about the freedom. And capitalism is about freedom. Capitalism is a system in which we protect individual rights and we leave people free to live their life based on their own judgment, in pursuit of their own values, ultimately in the pursuit of their own happiness. Capitalism is about happiness. It is a wonderful system because it does leave individuals free to make of their lives what they see fit. And it's sad because we live in an era today where capitalism is clearly in decline everywhere except in Argentina, as it turns out. But it is in decline everywhere. Uh, and it's decline across the political spectrum. There are really no champions for capitalism today in America. There are no champions for capitalism in Europe. Uh, you know, today you have various forms of socialism fighting it out, fa various iterations of socialism and fascism uh, fighting it out. There's really no defense of individual liberty being given out there today. No defense of a true freedom that involves a true capitalism, um, a, you know, true protection of individual rights. Uh, let me end by encouraging you, uh, if you're interested in all this, to read Ayn Rand, those of you who haven't, I know a bunch of you haven't, uh, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead. Uh, she, she's got a book called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, which is about what capitalism is and a little bit about the history of capitalism and, um, and, and why it's an unknown, but it's an ideal. Unknown in a sense that we've never actually lived it fully. We've come close, particularly in America, Hong Kong, but we've never actually fully lived it. Um, so I encourage you uh, to read that. All right. Well, uh, I'll take I'll take any questions you guys might. Have. Hi. All that empirical evidence of capitalism working, and no one's left in the world, and everyone is buying into all of this socialism. Why we are human beings? Is it just the power that the that the elite? Can wield? I just don't understand what's I happening. I did not plant this question. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I, I I was thinking about time, but usually I go into the whole why, and and it's it's a little spiel. But but uh, look, it's unequivocal that capitalism works. Capitalism produces the results. It makes us rich, and yet we hate it, and everybody hates it. It, it's you, you like I mean it's it's uniform in the world today. There literally is not a politician in America today who wants capitalism. Uh, I mean, the only politician right now running for president, for example, who mentions the word capitalism is is Haley, and he, and she doesn't really get it. She doesn't fully understand. And again, the whole world is turned against. It and has been turning against it forever, and Latin America saw what capitalism did to Chile, and it turns against it, and on and on and on. So the question is why? What, what's so offensive about capitalism? So, so what's, what at the core is capitalism about? We talked a little bit about this. What's, what at the core is capitalism about? Doing what? Responsible for your own life. Responsible for your own life. The, the market, what does the market mean? Yeah. Pursuing your self-interest? Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, capitalism is about the pursuit of self-interest. Right? I said, it's about using your mind in pursuit of your values and ultimately in the pursuit of your happiness. God, that sounds really self-interested to me. So, even, you know, just, just laying it out theoretically like that, capitalism is about the pursuit of self-interest. But if we just think about the mechanisms, right, the market, wh why, do, why does Steve Jobs sell this? Wh wh why, why does Apple sell these, uh, these phones? People want to buy them. Yeah, I don't care what people <coughs> want to buy, right? People want to buy, you know, flying, flying cars, but I'm not selling flying cars. They why am I selling this? They make them rich. Yeah, they can make money. Yeah, it's interesting how long it takes for people to say, because they want to make money. Right? You'd think that would be the first thing that comes to mind. But we were a little embarrassed about making money, right? We live in a culture where it's a little embarrassing to make money. Beginning of a hint of why capitalism, we don't like capitalism. 
this is why I'm making money. They sell gazillions of these. You know what the profit? I mean, if, yeah, they make it well. They, they build them really <laughs> solid so they don't break. <laughs> you know, you know what the profit margin on this thing is? It's like fifty percent. I mean, they can, if they if they cared about me, they just wanted to give it to me because I wanted it. They'd sell it a lot cheaper. This is a thousand bucks. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's worth tens of thousands to me, but it's a thousand bucks. And I remember first time I went to buy my first iPhone. It was 2008, just come out, and uh, the U.S. economy was spiraling into a recession. And I, you know, the good Keynesian that I am, I, I understood that the way to help the U.S. economy out of a recession was to go to consume. So I went and bought my iPhone because I, I wanted to make sure people had jobs, and I did my bit in helping the economy keep going. Because I know that's why you go to the mall. You all go shopping in order to help your fellow man, make sure people have jobs, right? Nobody ever goes to the mall for that. Right? Usually there's one, right? Why do you go to the mall? Why do you go buy? Why did I buy my iPhone? Because I want stuff. Because I want stuff. For a variety of reasons I might want stuff. Hopefully they're rational. Hopefully they're good reasons. But because I want stuff. Because I want to make my life. I buy them because I believe it. I'll make my life better. Steve Jobs builds the iPhone because he wants to make money. Now, is it only because he wants to make money? Is there anything else going on there? No, he loves it. He loves it. He loves it. He, he dreams about this stuff. He imagines this stuff. He loves this. This is beautiful. He may, every time he sees this, it makes his day to design and produce products that are beautiful, that are effective. That, that was his, that's what he was. So he loved it and he made money. So Steve Jobs would be unbelievably sell <coughs> selfish when he made the iPhone. And I was pretty selfish when I went and bought it. I was doing it for me. I didn't care about Apple. Didn't care about, didn't care about the economy. Didn't care about anybody. I just wanted a phone. <coughs> capitalism is a system about the pursuit of self-interest. Which means capitalism is a system about the pursuit of selfishness. We're all selfish under capitalism in one way or another. It indeed encourages that. Right? If you're very good at finding what you love and you're very good at making money, you'll make a lot of money. And that'll give you more capital to invest in more stuff so you can make even more money and make the stuff you want to make and it just it reinforces it. And I buy an iPhone and I have to buy the next iPhone and another iPhone and I keep pursuing these selfish you know, wants that I have. What do we know about selfishness? I know what my mother taught me about selfishness. I don't know what your mother taught you, but am I guessing that she, all mothers teach the same thing about selfishness, sadly? I mean, not my wife, which she was my, uh, a mother, but, but most of them. Selfishness is bad. It's terrible. What's the essence of morality? Selflessness. Selflessness. The exact opposite of selfishness. I mean, we hear it even when we talk about basketball. To be a good player is to be a selfless player, right? <laughs> it's just like stupid. <laughs> right? I'm passing the ball so we can win the game because I'm selfless or because I want to win the game. I'm being super selfish. But selflessness is virtue. It's good. When we say somebody acted selflessly, everybody goes, ooh. And we have a little halo above their head. And it's beautiful. <laughs> and if we say somebody acted selfishly, we go, oh my God. That is horrible. He's condemned to hell in this lifetime. Capitalism is incompatible with our morality. It's incompatible with ethics. The Judo-Christian ethics is incompatible with capitalism. So every time we advance a little bit with capitalism, we get a little richer, we feel super guilty, and we go, oh my God! I'm pursuing self-interest and I'm not helping all those people and I'm, I'm getting really rich and there's inequality and there's... I, I'm having too much fun. Mm -hmm. That's not allowed. Our religion doesn't allow it. Our philosophers don't allow it. So we backtrack a little bit and we socialize and we regulate and we control and I feel a little better. My, my, my guilt is a little reduced. I mean, why do we have high taxes? And, and what, how do rich people vote on taxes? Do rich people vote to increase taxes or to decrease taxes? Increase taxes. Increase taxes. They always do. Rich people vote Democratic. They don't vote Republican because of taxes. 
In California, there was, a ta there was this tax that was going to raise for millionaires from 10% to 13% state income tax. Rich people all voted for it. <coughs> Why? Because here's the deal. You guys are selfish. You, you're rich. You're obviously selfish. You're not helping people the way you should. Your morality tells you to be selfless and to help other people. You're not helping them. So we, the government, are going to help you be better human beings. We're going to raise your taxes by 3% and we'll take care of helping those people and you can sleep better at night. Okay? I vote for that. Well, I'll vote for that, right? But you give it to the people who are corrupt. Yeah, but I don't want to give it to anybody. I'm selfish. It, uh, the corruption is not the issue. I imagine the politicians are saints. Why do we regulate businessmen? Why do we regulate businessmen? Well, one argument is, uh, is because corporations can't be trusted to protect the environment, so the government has to inter intervene on behalf of them. Put aside the environment. We regulate businesses in terms of how they treat their employees. We regulate businesses how they treat their customers. We regulate businesses in how they build their buildings. We regulate businesses on, on the safety of their equipment. We, we regulate businesses in every single, how they do their accounting. The government tells us how we should add up our loss, our, our, our profit and losses. And if you don't do it right, you, go to, you could go to jail, right? And, 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 and everything, every single decision a businessman made is being regulated. Why? Because they're so greedy. Because we know, we know that businessmen are selfish. I just illustrated it that Steve Jobs built this because he loved it and because he was making money from it. And what do we know about selfish people? The bad. The bad, the lying, cheating, stealing, SOBs. All of them. Now, we might not have caught you yet, but we know, we know you're doing it. We know you're cheating. My mother used to tell me, every millionaire out there is a crook. You can't become a millionaire unless you're a crook. And I think most people, to some extent, believe that. And even if they don't believe that, they believe that if you just loosen the regulations a little bit, they will become crooks. They will do bad things. So we regulate because we want to control the selfish behavior. So capitalism is incompatible with the moral code that we have. And the, the amazing thing about Ayn Rand is, and I think what Ayn Rand really brings to the table more than anything else, is an alternative to the Judeo-Christian morality. Because the Judeo-Christian morality is incompatible with modern life. It's incompatible with capitalism. It's incompatible with wealth creation. It's incompatible with the kind of world we, we claim we want to live in. And, the, and because of that, we keep backtracking away. Every time we enjoy the fruits of capitalism, we immediately retreat from it because it doesn't sit well, because it, 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 it's morally, it, we feel offended, offended by it. So you need a new morality. Ayn Rand offers us a new morality, a new morality built on the idea of rational self-interest, long-term rational self-interest, of a rational form of selfishness, what that means, that selfishness really is rational. We can go into that if anybody wants. Yeah. Um, so this, I feel like you're giving us kind of an atheistic point of view. Do you think that, like, full capitalism is incompatible with religion, and we should we like abandon all Judeo-Christian values? So do I think capitalism is incompatible with religion? Like Judaism and Christianity. Yeah. I, I mean, I think if you push it hard enough, then the answer is going to be yes. I think it is incompatible. Um, but I think that the 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 the, 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 where the rubber hits the road, if you will, um, is going to be on the ethical point that I just mentioned. If you interpret Christianity, and to some extent Judaism, as being about sacrifice, self-sacrifices, the essence of morality is self-sacrifice, self-denial, is living for others, that's not compatible with capitalism. It's never going to lead you to a capitalist society. And I think it's not an accident. It's not an accident that capitalism comes about at kind of the height of the Enlightenment a period where religion is being questioned, a period where, where religion is being challenged, and a period where reason is, at the, uh, is uh, on the rise, and in a sense religion is being relegated. It's not eliminated, they're not atheists, but religion is being relegated to the private life and in, the, in, in, in our <coughs> public lives. Um, you know, even Adam Smith says, we, we, we you know, uh, uh, the baker makes the bread not because he loves you, he makes the bread for his own self-interest. So, it, it, you know, the morality of 
um, self-sacrifice is incompatible with a morality of the pursuit of a system of the pursuit of happiness. They're two different things, and they're not compatible. So, yeah. should we? Are you saying we should like abandon religion and morals so that we can become rich? No, I'm saying we should become moral so that we should become rich. I'm saying that morality needs to be reconceived. There is no one system morality, and you know there's no one system morality because every religion offers us a different one. And uh, religions in the Far East offer a different set of moral code than uh, Christianity will, and Christianity's moral code is different than the Jewish. I mean, we talk about the Jewish Christian moral code, but I, 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 you know, if anybody wants to get into a discussion about the differences, the massive differences between morality under Judaism and morality under Christianity, um, I just think King David, uh, King David is not very Christian <laughs> in, in his behavior and his actions. So, they, they, you know, you've got different moral codes. And even Christianity, there's not one interpretation of Christian morality. There's multiple cr interpretation of Christian morality. Well, we live under this conception, I think delusion, that there's only one morality, and that's the Christian morality. And everything outside of that is, is not morality. Mm -hmm. I'm saying you've got to expand what you conceive of as morality. Or you've got to be willing to rethink what you conceive of as morality. Mm -hmm. And that the modern world has shown us that this morality is incompatible with life. And that we need to reconceive or rethink our conceptions of morality. I, God forbid I don't, God, but whatever. I don't, I'm not advocating for abandoning morality, even though I might be advocating ultimately for abandoning God. I'm not advocating for abandoning morality. Morality is the system by which we live. It's, I, it's how we know what right and wrong is. But I want, I want a right and wrong that is derived from reason and reality and facts. I don't want a right and wrong that is, is derived from mysticism <coughs> and tradition. Uh, I want something that I can prove logically, rationally. Yeah, everybody's eager now. Because yeah. we, got to, we got to religion. This is fun. Um, yes. Yeah, I guess um, my question is like, to what extent do you think capitalism breeds expectation because I do think that self-interest is great and I think if anything like like we're saying like changing the idea of morality like, if everyone did serve their self-interest then it would be like it would serve everyone right but yeah um, I do wonder like if everyone did take on you know that self-interest of you know their own self-interest then how would that affect others like um, would that start to breed so what's the fundamental nature of, of uh, human relationships under capitalism uh, in, in, a, in this market economy, right? What, what, do you, what do we do in markets? How do we treat one another? Right? You, you, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't lie because there are real consequences for that. And, you know, I will argue it's, it's, it's wrong for a variety of, uh, of reasons. It's bad for you. It's not self-interested. But, but so how do you deal with other people? What's a fun way in which you deal with other people? Trade. Yeah, trade. You trade. And what's the nature of trade? I have this thing, you have that thing. That is why, do we, why do we swap? Because I need that thing. Do you need, I'm sure you need my iPhone. I'm not giving yeah, it to you. Yeah, but like you need what I have too. Yeah, so it has to be, I, I want what you have and you want what I have. And we, uh, I value what you have more than what I have. So I'm willing to give up my thing in order to get yours. So let's say you have $1,000, I have an iPhone. And I say, yeah, the iPhone's not worth, you know, not worth $1,000 to me. I'd rather have the $1,000. You would rather have the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Who lost in that transaction? Nobody. Nobody. Uh, the beauty of self-interested human relationships is they're built on the principle of win-win. They're built on the principle of trade. They're built on the principle of we all benefit. I don't interact with you if I'm going to lose. I don't expect you to interact with me if you're going to lose. And that is true in the material world, in the material sense, but that is also true in friendship. Right? If, if friendship is not built around win-win, if you're giving and a friend is just taking, it's not going to last. Marriage is not going to last if it's not a win-win relationship. As soon as it becomes a win-lose, it'll become a lose-lose very, very quickly. Um, so, you build human relationships around win-win relationships, about creating these win-win relationships between people. Um, so, and everybody's pursuing their own self-interest. 
because everybody's trying to be better. But they're becoming better by making other people better. Everybody's better off. Then why do people hate People hate capitalism because it's not about becoming better. And it's not about making the world a better place. It's about sacrifice. It's about suffering. I mean, that's what's good, right? Why, why is Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa did not help a lot of people in the world. She didn't numerically... Somebody like Steve, Bill Gates helped a lot more people than Mother Teresa. <coughs> Bill Gates changed the world. He improved the lives of the poor by orders of magnitude more than Mother Teresa ever did. But it was a magnitude. He literally helped every person on planet Earth has been touched by Bill Gates and his life has improved because of Microsoft. Is he going to be a saint? No, we hate him. Because he's rich. And because he benefited from the fact that he, we love Mother Teresa, even though she didn't help that many people. The f it, reality, fact, she helped 10,000 people, let's say. <coughs> Bill Gates helped billions. So it's not a matter of changing the world. It's not a matter of helping people. They both help people. Bill Gates helped people more. <coughs> but he also helped himself at the same time. Mother Teresa is a saint, not because she helped people, but because she suffered doing it. That's what made it, and that's the ethic we have. When does Bill Gates become a little bit better of a human being? We hated him when he was CEO of Microsoft. Now we hate him again because we think he's behind every conspiracy theory in the world. But, uh, you know, we hated him when he was head of Microsoft. And then he became a philanthropist. He left Microsoft. And we started liking him again. Now, why? Is he going to help more people as a philanthropist or more people as a businessman? You can ask this to any businessman. Are you going to help the world? Are you going to change the world more as a businessman or as a philanthropist? Where do you think you have more impact on the world? Business. Business, by far. It's not even close. Yeah, yeah we hate the businessman. We love the philanthropist. Yeah. And they even feel it themselves because they carry this ethic inside of them. But that's crazy. The, the, the businessman is helping his customers. He's helping his employees. He's creating an industry. He's making his life better. He's helping his family. He's becoming richer and wealthier. And he, he can do whatever he wants with his money. He can also be a philanthropist. But as a philanthropist, he's helping a few people. But he's not adding to the wealth. It's done. And yet we love that because he's giving and not any, getting anything in return. And here he's getting something in return. And that's what we don't like. By the way, I don't expect you to agree with me. Right? I'm just, just as a general thing. I, you know, I, I, I expect you to think. Hopefully this creates a little cognitive dissonance. Hopefully, maybe five years from now you'll agree with me. Um, read a few books, it wouldn't be bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I know a lot of what I'm saying is pretty shocking and upsetting and, and uh, uh, non-PC, but, uh, it, 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 you know, so be it. Yeah. So you suggest that what we ought to do is sort of what's in our rational self-interest yeah. in the long term. So there's a famous case given by the philosopher Peter Singer, where you stumble across a drowning child, you have the opportunity to weigh and supply and save them. The child, they won't benefit you. You know, suppose that you just you just know you'll never see the child again. Yep. They're not going to benefit you in any way in the long term. I think sort of most people would say, uh, perhaps with the exception of a few objectivists, that what you ought to do is save the child. Yep. Um, but it, it seems like if one that should only act in their rational self-interest... Yeah, but that's not the end of Peter Singer's argument, right? Peter Singer goes on to say, um, he goes on to say and say, well, okay, so you do that the one time. Let's say you do that the one time, but then uh, the next day you, you walk by the river and there's another drowning child. Do you save him? Well, yeah, of course. You saved him like yesterday. Of course, you're going to save him today. And it turns out that drowning children flowing through this river constantly. And he says, look, this is the reality you live in. It, it, it's not a river with a drowning child. But right now, as we speak, there are children in Africa dying of starvation, and you're not helping them. And it would cost you less to help them than it would those clothes that you, uh, he, he, he posits that you're wearing a suit, and you're off to so, so kind of, so you've ruined the suit. It's cost you $300 to save the child. So it's even worse, right? It's not just your time. He says, why don't you send every single day $300 to Africa, right? 10% of your income, tithing, is, is, is what he, he does and what he asks his followers to do. It's his, there's a whole movement around this called uh, effective altruism. There he is, right? So my answer is this. If I walk across the river 
and it's, you know, there's an emergency and out of nowhere a child is drowning, first I'm going to shave this child because I love human life. It's part of my value hierarchy. V human life is incredibly valuable. Um, there's, this child has immense potential. Objectivism doesn't hold and, and lo my long-term rational self-interest doesn't hold that I have to, that everything is transactional in a sense that I have to get something monetarily immediately in return. You know, a, a lot of us have pets. I don't, but a lot of you guys probably have pets. Right? And we care for those pets. What do we get back? They can't give us money. They can't produce anything. They can't, but, but there's a value. I mean, I even like plants. And I water the plant, and I don't get anything in return. But I value life. Life is a value, and yes, I'm willing to go into that river and save that child. But you know what? If every single freaking day there's a child in the river drowning, there's a limit. I'm not going to save every single child. And I won't. It becomes, it stops being an emergency. It becomes being a freak. It becomes now a state of nature. I, you want to look at the source of this. Why are there children uh, floating in the river drowning? You want to try to solve it at the source if you're going to solve it at all. But now it's, it goes way beyond my problem. And I don't send money to Africa as a consequence. Because I'm not troubled by the fact that there are people dying. I mean, vaguely it troubles me, but it's far away, and it's not that much of my concern. If it was right here, if it's one-off, sure. But I am rationally self-interested. It is my life. It's my values. And the child in Africa is less valued to me than the child right here. And the child right here is less valuable than my child. I often ask people, if two kids are drowning, one of them is your kid and one is the neighbor's kid, Peter Singer would tell you they're equally valuable. Indeed, you would have to assess if the neighbor's kid has a higher IQ than your kid is likely to contribute more to society, then you should save the neighbor and let your kid drown. I save my kid, and I don't feel guilty about it at all. And, I don't, and I'm not measuring their IQs in the process. Right? So, yes, I, I mean, there are clearly differences between Peter Singer and I. Um, and I think Peter Singer is wrong. I think he's badly, badly, badly wrong. It's awful. Yes. Hold on, Prosper. We're about out of time. So this will be the last question. Okay. Uh, I just you mentioned um, uh, Bill Gates and uh, other choice. Well, yeah. Well, um, actually, uh, sorry, the creator of the iPhone, um, Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs. Uh, and um, I was curious, uh, like whether you think that their um, sort of heroic capitalistic um, members of society in the, in the sort of Randian sense, um, like what you think about those people who are creating wealth certainly, um, but doing so in the system that exists now, which is obviously greatly exploitative and um, you know, we're like late stage Atlas Shrugged at this point, the, like I mean, how we'd be you know, late stage at the shrug for a long in the, time. In the sense, yeah. I mean, so what do you think about people like that that are, um, you know, they're bad. They're kind of bad. So in a mixed economy, we're not cap. We're not in capitalism, pure capitalism. There's regulations, there's controls, there's taxes. Right. How do we know that these entrepreneurs are really creating something of value? Right, and and are they good people? I mean, do you think they're good people? Uh, what do you think of? God, I don't know. I mean, isn't it obvious? They're amazing people. I, I don't know what they do in their private lives, and uh, I suspect they're pretty good in their private lives, although far from perfect, as Steve Jobs, I think his life shows. Jeff, but they're pretty good, right? What's that? Well, I mean, what about people like Jeffrey Epstein and those people? I mean, well, Jeffrey Epstein was 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 a was a was a, a, he was a lying, stealing creep. Well, who yeah, well, justifiably. Hopefully he killed himself or was murdered. I don't really care as long as he's dead, right? But he's a, he was a bad guy. He was being cool, but you don't think his... I mean, there are all these associates and whatnot and the stuff Bill Gates... Most of them, most of the associates, yes. I mean, uh, they are bad people involved. Well, so what's the explanation for that? I mean, why aren't, why is, why aren't all these giants of capitalism like well, first, Reardon? I, Steve Jobs and... Don't mix up Steve Jobs and Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, uh, Steve Jobs died before Jeffrey Epstein did what he did. You know, I, I, I would not confuse them. I, I don't think Bill Gates is involved in that CD side of Jeffrey Epstein, although Steve, uh, Bill Gates should not have had anything to do with uh, Jeffrey Epstein once he knew what Jeffrey Epstein was up to. Um, uh, you know, so, no, I think, look, I can only judge them based on what I know. 
and you can only judge another person based on what you know about the person, right? If they're an, an axe murderer in secret in the dark somewhere and you don't know, you can't judge that. You can't be skeptical, oh, because they're powerful, they must be axe murderers on the side. No, right? I judge them based on what I know. Steve Jobs was an amazing human being. Everything I know about him, it, it, you know, it was amazing. Did he make mistakes? Sure, he killed himself. He decided to do to juice uh, to do a juice thing instead of actually getting surgery. Uh, he probably treated his uh, his uh, his daughter didn't treat her pretty w well. But you know, every other aspect of his life, he's a giant. And to say, oh, because of whatever, no, I mean. Uh, and and the capitalism would that mean that he's going to treat if we had pure capitalism would every capitalist then treat his daughter right? People are still mixed. People are people are not uh, always perfect. We sp I mean if you're if you're good and you're moral you aspire to perfection in morality, but it's hard and people fail and people and particularly given a world in which we don't know what's good and what's bad, what morality really is about. You know. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, if you don't get your morality right, you're going to do a lot of damage to yourself and to others. Mm -hmm. And most people, in spite of the fact that they're great capitalists, are taught a bad morality. So they're very mixed. What I think is a bad morality, obviously, not everybody agrees with me about what a bad morality and good morality is. And as a consequence, they're very mixed. Because they're torn between I think what they do in business, which is right, and what which is striving towards doing right, and what they do in their personal lives, which is guided by a morality, which I think is crooked. Thanks. Thank you.